Hello and welcome to another GCSE podcast, this one being on the muscular system. In your exam, you need to be able to identify the 11 major muscles in the human body. You need to understand the role of movement that is produced from each muscle and also relate these to sporting examples. Okay, so here is the big picture of the muscular system and the contents in this podcast. Looking at the function of the system, we know straight away that the primary purpose for our muscular system is to provide us with movement. So let's now have a look and see if we can locate the 11 main muscles in the human body. Okay, so here you can see a diagram of the human body. Press pause now on the podcast and actually have a go at see if you can identify all the 11 major muscles of the human body and then press play again to see the answers. Okay, so here are all the 11 answers. Hopefully you got them all right. If you didn't, by all means go back and have another attempt and then move forward again. In order for us to understand the different types of movements produced by the muscles, we need to know the five different types of joint actions as you can see here. So the first one we'll look at is flexion. And basically flexion is where the angle at the joint decreases. So as you can see here at the elbow joint, as the arm is brought upwards, the angle is decreased. So therefore it must be flexion. Likewise, extension is where the angle of the joint increases. So as you can see here in the diagram, the guy is extending his lower leg at the knee joint. So the angle is increasing. Abduction and adduction is basically, you need to imagine that there is a line running through the center of the body. And basically abduction is where you are taking away from the body. So the arm coming away, if you say abduction at the leg, that is the leg moving away from the centre of line at the body. Adduction, on the other hand, is just the opposite. So you are bringing it back to the centre of the line. If you imagine add, you are adding to the centre line in the human body. And then finally, rotation, which is just movement around a joint. Now, rotation gives us our largest range of movement, and which is why it occurs at ball and socket joints. For all these types of movements, we'll look at sporting examples in a short while. Okay, so a few things that you need to know about muscles and movement are that muscles actually can't push. So you're probably thinking, well, how do I actually perform push type movements such as a bench press, a chest pass, a basketball or a netball? And basically if you think that whenever muscles contract they are pulling on the skeleton. So when the arm's extending here at the humerus, so the arm extends, the tricep is actually pulling on the lower arm, which therefore causes the arm to extend, allowing you to push. So we now know that when muscles contract, they pull against the skeleton, which results in movement taking place. And then finally, as you can see in the diagram, that muscles are actually attached to the skeleton by tendons. So now that we know that muscles can only pull, it means that they generally work in pairs, which is what we call antagonistic. This generally means that as one muscle is contracting, causing a pulling action, the other is relaxing. Now if we use this example here of the arm, when the bicep contracts, which is what we call the agonist muscle, which results in a pulling of the lower arm upwards, which is what we know as flexion because the angle at the joint is decreasing. Now as the bicep contracts, the tricep is relaxing which is what we call the antagonist. Now the roles reverse when the tricep contracts causing the lower arm to move downwards which you know is extension because the angle at the joint is increasing so now that the tricep is contracting it therefore must be the agonist muscle and the bicep is relaxing so therefore it must be the antagonist muscle. Okay, so the first muscle that we'll look at is our deltoid, and this is what gives our shoulder the rounded shape. Now, the deltoid 
when it contracts, it is responsible for abducting our upper arm away from the body. So as you can see in our example here with Roger Federer, Roger Federer is having to abduct his upper arm to perform the serve. So by lifting his arm above his head, he can then perform the serve correctly. Now the trapezius muscle is attached to the head and neck at the top and the shoulder below. Now its main function is to rotate the shoulder blade. The most common sporting type movement is a butterfly arm action in swimming and this is when the arms are thrown sideways and backwards out of the water. So here we have the latissimus dorsi which is located in the side of your back. Now please make note of the spelling, it only has one T but two S's and when this contracts it adducts the upper arm so the key point is the upper arm at the shoulder so it's bringing the upper arm back towards the body. So if we use a sporting example here such as trampolining and we imagine after a straight jump they are bringing their arms back to the side of their body. So here you can see our pectoral muscles which are located at the front of our upper chest. Now the pectoral muscles are similar to latissimus dorsi that they also adduct the arm at the shoulder joint. So they are responsible for, for bringing the whole of the arm, not just the upper arm, but the whole of the arm down towards the center line of the body. So if we use Roger Federer again as another sporting example, you can see that during the forehand on the follow through, he is having to use his pectoral muscles to adduct his arm at the shoulder to bring his arm across his body. So if you imagine that his arm is coming towards the centre of line, so therefore it must be adduction. So here we have our abdominal muscles, really straightforward. When these type of muscles contract, they produce a flexion of the trunk. And here if we use a simple sporting example of a pike dive in a diving position, it clearly shows that when the abdominals contract, flexion of the trunk occurs. So moving on to our gluteal muscles, which are located on our buttocks. The type of movement produced when these type of muscles contract is extension of the leg at the hip. So a clear sporting example here with Usain Bolt sprinting. He's having to contract his gluteal muscles to move his leg backwards. Now if we can see here at the hip joint, we can clearly see that the angle has increased because the legs move backwards, so therefore it must be extension. Quadricep muscles located on the front of the upper leg, and these are responsible for providing extension at the knee joint. So here in the picture, we've got Cristiano Ronaldo striking a football. If you imagine that his lower leg has started here, when his quadriceps contract, it therefore results in the lower leg becoming straightened. As this happens, we notice as the extension at the angle at the joint is increased. In your exam, you need to be specific when identifying when extension occurs so at the knee joint in this picture is when Cristiano Ronaldo is striking the ball during a follow through phase so before when we just talked about the quadriceps being located at the front of the upper leg the hamstrings are actually located behind the upper leg and these are another example of an antagonistic pair so when one is contracting the other is relaxing now when the hamstrings are contracting, flexion of the leg at the knee joint is occurred. So here we have Jessica Rennes going over the hurdles and you can see her right leg, her training leg, is having to flex at the knee. As you can see the angle is reduced and this allows her training leg to be bent and to go over the hurdle. And finally our gastrocnemius muscle which is located at the back of our lower leg these muscles are responsible for plantar flexing the ankle, which basically means extension of the ankle. A sporting example of this is when you have to point your toes, such as in gymnastics performing 
a range of jumps. So we know from the start of this GCSE podcast, we know that the primary purpose for our muscular system is for movement. Now for our muscles to produce movement, they must contract and lengthen. And there are two types of contractions. The first one is what we call an isometric contraction. This type of muscular contraction is where the muscle length actually stays the same. However, there is an increase in tension. So if we use an example of the plank, you are actually staying still. There is no change in length for the muscles. However, you can actually feel your core muscles contracting. The second type of contraction is called an isotonic contraction. And this results in movement of the limb. So the muscle is changing in length. Now the way to remember this is if you imagine a leucosate spot, which is also known as an isotonic drink. So we drink leucosate to give us energy for movement to produce to be produced so an isotonic drink can make the link to isotonic contractions so if we look at the immediate effects of exercise on a muscular system we know straight away if we start exercising we have an increase in the body's demand for oxygen and glycogen the reason being is that glycogen can be converted to glucose to provide our muscles with energy as our muscles start to contract Extra waste products are created as our muscles are having to work harder than normal. When the demand for oxygen is so high that not enough can be provided to the muscles, this is where lactic acid begins to build up and eventually can lead to cramp. The long term effects of exercise on the muscular system results in an increase in muscle size and therefore an increase in muscle strength a term that is known as hypertrophy. As muscular strength increases, so does muscular endurance. Likewise, so does power, because power is strength times speed. The effects this has is that it produces a firmer looking body, better posture and stronger tendons. Now tendons, if you can remember, attach muscles to bones. However, when we do become injured, this generally results in strength training becoming stopped. Now, the principle of training of reversibility occurs because our adaptations of an increase in muscle strength and muscle size becomes reversed, so we end up losing our muscle mass and size. This is what we call as muscle atrophy. So the opposite of hypertrophy, muscle atrophy. Okay, so the most common muscle type injuries that occur are tears, pulls and strains. Now, the way we can prevent these is warming up. Now, warming up, obviously the benefits of warming up is that it increases the muscle temperature, which therefore increases the elasticity in the muscles, which allows greater movement to take place. If a muscular injury does occur during a sporting activity, then the physiotherapist on hand will adopt a procedure that we call the RICE treatment. Now the R stands for rest. So you rest the type of muscle that is injured. The I stands for ice. So if you apply ice to the muscle injury, it reduces the swelling and also numbs the pain. C stands for compression that also helps to reduce the swelling so just providing the compression with the ice pack reduces the swelling and finally the letter E stands for elevation elevation and this is basically where you raise the injury just to keep it raised and that reduces the swelling because it restricts the blood flow going to that muscle as the blood is having to fight against gravity.